Bruchim Aboyim. We are now in the middle of a uh, series of uh, the topic of gematrias and things that are related um, to gematrias. Again, gematrias are numbers that the Hebrew alphabet, again, is both a combination of um, letters that also become numbers. Again, Aleph is one, Bez is two, so on and so forth. And we'll get into things related to that as well. Last week, we uh, first two weeks, we did introduction. Last week was the gematria dealing with the letter and the number Aleph 1. Uh, this week, we're up to Bez. Again, the second level, letter, letter and number, number 2 in the Hebrew uh, alphabet and counting system. The number 2 is the introduction to the world of many. The plural starts with two. The presence of two parties opens up the possibility of a relationship, one in which the first subject interacts with the second. Now, this, of course, could only begin with the creation of the universe. Before then, there was only one, the unity of God. After creation, there existed a possibility for a prototype and ultimate relationship between God and his creations. The concept of bracha, which means blessing, is founded upon the number two. The Torah narrative recounts the events of creation by opening with a bays, the second letter of the Hebrew alpha, alphabet, with the word bereshit, again, b, starting with the, the bays, which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. God is self-contained and perfect. His creations are neither. It is for this reason that they must engage in a give and take interactions with each other. Perfection cannot come from within, only from without. This key principle lies in the center of the man-woman relationship. Together, a husband and wife complement each other in a union of blessing. A man without a wife, for example, is said to live without blessing. And furthermore, their marital union can lead, can lead man and woman to become partners with God in the creation of a new life, children. The first myth, in fact, mentioned in the Torah is the obligation for man to procreate, what we call pru or revu, be fruitful and multiply. There are many opposing forces within the universe. Some well-known counterparts within creation include life and death, truth and falsehood, left and right, up and down. In the laws of physics, forces occur in pairs that are opposite in direction and equal in magnitude. There are positive and negative polarities of electrical charges and the opposite poles of north and south and magnetic fields. In the spiritual realm, there are counterparts in areas such as ritual purity and ritual impurity, what is forbidden and what is permitted, objects that are sacred and objects that are mundane. The existence of opposites often result in a clash between two counterparts standing on opposite sides. This leads to division and to break to a breakdown in the relationship, with the number two reflecting the conflict. The first example of such a division was day two of creation, when God divided the waters in the formation of the heavens above and the oceans below beginning all were together, and then God divided them. The phrase, it was good, used to describe God's assessment of the other days of creation, is obviously missing on the second day, when conflict and division first appeared in the world. The first historic, historic argument between Adam Harisha and first man's two sons, Cain and Hevel, tragically led to murder. The conflict between Yaakov's sons the catalyst to the Egyptian exile was attributed to their jealousy of Yosef's Kasonus Pasim, the coat of many colors, which weighed two sela. On the second day after Moshe Benu left Paro's palace in Egypt to observe the fate of his persecuted brethren, he intervened in a fight between two Jews. And the first unresolved rabbinic dispute in the transmission of the Mesorah, the oral tradition, was between what we call the Zugot, the pairs of leading scholars in the court. Of all the conflicts, the most serious is that between man and his creator. Man was created to align his personal will with the will of God so that they are one and the same. Sin damages this relationship. Man's independent behavior makes it appear 
that there are actually two separate and independent entities, the will of God and the will of man. This possibility was played out at the outset of creation with Adam, first man, and Chava, first woman, defying God's command in favor of their own desire to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Sin implies a departure from what came before. This is reflected in the word Shnayim, that which means two, related to the words Shneot, alternatives or secondary, or Shinoi, which is the word for change. Here man deviates from the path defined by God, opting to undertake an alternative direction. Man is able to exercise his independence through the use of what we call bechira, free will. Typically, he must select from a minimum of two alternatives, right and wrong, good or evil. The spiritual component within man, his soul, is pulled towards his, what we call the Yetzatov, his good inclination, urging him to choose good, tov. Its goal is to purify the body by elevating it toward godliness and the world to come. At the same time, the physical side of man, his body, is influenced by what we call the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, which is drawn after evil. Its pursuit of worldly pleasures means the rejection of anything spiritual or godly. Each presents itself as an equally viable and compelling choice. It is up to the individual to make the correct choice. As the Torah states in the Tzavim, chapter 30, verse 15, See, I have placed before you that on this day life and good and death and evil. Choose life. Every individual must imagine that the scale of good deeds, which are mitzvot, and evil deeds, averot, are finally balanced. One good deed or one evil deed can determine the fate of the world. In fact, the Rambam says that each person should see himself as balanced equally between good and evil, and one deed that he does will tip the scale for a life of goodness versus one of sorrow or death, but not just for him, but for the whole world. That's how everything is so closely related. What a, what, what a person becomes is essentially shaped by his choices. A righteous life leads to a reward of delight with God in heaven. A sinful life distances man from his creator, which necessitates a painful purification experience in purgatory. Plurality does not have to bring with it conflict. The spectacular symmetries within nature can be seen in plant leaves, the wings of butterflies, the structure of crystals and the formation of snowflakes. We also see this in the anatomical design of man's limbs and organs, his eyes, nostrils, ears, lips, arms, hands, legs, ankles, and feet. The opposites become the amazing reflection of the other. The symmetries in nature are symbolic of the spiritual symmetries within existence. God and his creations, when they follow his instructions, the spiritual world and the physical world, heaven and earth, man and woman, the written Torah and the oral Torah, the two tablets of the covenant, positive and negative commandments, hand and head, head to fill in, phylacteries, are all some examples of this idea. The Jew is consistent in his timeless commitment to God through his continuous adherence to Torah values. By emulating God, man transforms himself into a godly being, blending the two opposing forces, good and evil, into one positive force serving his creator, culminating in the purpose of creation. So with creation came choice, and that really is what the difference is and the importance of man, because the reality is, uh, is, and we understand it better today than we ever had before, the whole world is a computer program. Nothing, I repeat, nothing in creation goes against that program. Nothing has Bechira. 
They can tell you when Haley's Comet's going to come, and it will come at the exact time that they mention. Everything is a program. What is different, man was created as B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. God has no form. God has no image. What does it mean, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God? What it means is that God has the ability to choose as to what he wants to do. And this ability he gave to man, even though we too are programmed, but we have the ability to break the program for good or for evil. That, cha- that choice, that bechira, two, is where the world begins. As long as there's one, there's no problem. Once it's two, now all of a sudden life becomes interesting. That choice between good and evil, right and wrong. And this is what God put us in this world to do. To follow the program, but at times to break the program, hopefully for good and to become better, to reach even higher than we thought we were able to. In fact, that's the reason why we bless our sons to be like Ephraim and Manasseh, not like the fathers, because we bless a girl to be like the mothers of Sarah, Rachel, Rivka, and Leah. And we would think that the young man would be blessed to be like the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not even the tribes. What a, child, what a child, a young boy, is blessed to be is like Ephraim and Manasseh, the two grandchildren of Yaakov, who were brought up in Egypt with a silver spoon in their mouth, the two sons of Yosef, who should have found it difficult to come to godliness and, and religion. Instead, they became the poster boys, if you will, for it. They were able to be m- more righteous, in fact, the gematria, of Ephraim and Manasseh 732, one more than Ruvain and Shimon. They were able to do something that was totally impossible. They were able to become part of the tribes of Israel. So what they were able to do is take their duality and use it in a proper way to become, both of them, a tribe in in their own right, and to overcome, to exceed their potential. What a blessing. To break the program to get even better than they were meant to be. It is our hope as parents that our children are able to reach their potential. What a lovely thing for a parent to see a child even exceeding his potential. So again, two is the ability of, uh, for us to choose. And this is what life's about. If we don't have that, then life is really useless. God is giving us the ability to choose between good and evil, right and wrong so that we can earn our place in the world to come instead of being given to us like a poor person as a gift with no real merit. God has put us into this world with these choices, and hopefully we should always make the right choice out of the two, and in this way we'll be able to come closer to our God in heaven and to reach that final reward in the world to come. Again, thank you very much for coming. Hopefully next week as we look forward to number three. Have a great Shabbos. God bless and be well.